Okay, so we'll just wait um, one minute and then we'll begin. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me all right? There's, the, there's a um, chat area at the bottom if you want to ask any questions. So there was an issue with the volume last time. So I did the random effects live stream before, but for some reason the audio didn't work. So can someone just type if they can hear? So is the sound working? Okay, so again, can someone just confirm the sounds are like? So I don't know. Last time um, I got to the end and it didn't save the the sound. So if someone can just type yes or just whatever in the in the box. In the, then you can use the chat function if you want to ask any questions as we're going through. If you just write in the box, there's about a thirty second um, delay. But once I get your question, I'll respond. Okay, well, we'll begin. Um, hopefully, you can hear all right. Um, where is it? Yeah, okay, good. Thanks for confirming because last time it didn't work and um, I don't know how to do it all um, again. So, we'll finish off the random effects and then we'll do some of the questions that we were going to do in the, um, in the last revision session. Okay, so the, the last lecture that we did together, we looked at um, panel data methods and we covered the three main methods. So the, the classic way that we do, the classic way that we um, estimate regression is to use pooled OLS. We just have all our observations. We've got YIT and we have some regressors XIT and we want to work out the effect of x on y, which is the beta. So we regress y on x, and beta is the parameter of interest. But as always, the classical problem is, when we run these types of regressions, there can be omitted variables. So the standard way to just pull, pulled OLS just takes all the observations together, and then it just runs the usual OLS. But the problem there, so just as a little bit of a recap, so remember the big, when we, when we work with panel, or in, in any regression, Sometimes we sometimes we don't observe both sometimes we don't observe both the the same people over time. But when we do that, can confer a benefit. So let's say, for example, we have this was the true model here. We have y i t, and then we've got everything else that's left out here. So what's the usual problem here? So even if we didn't even if we didn't have the even if we didn't have the time series element, we just had a cross section, and you regress say wages on schooling, or you regress say productivity on GDP. Well, the usual problem is that often there are some omitted variables which can be driving, which can be left in the error term, which can lead to an endogeneity. So pooled OLS, the crucial assumption for pooled OLS to work is that, as always, that the regressor is uncorrelated. So this we need this assumption for consistency. So we need both this to be not and this to be not. 
namely that the error term is uncorrelated with all of the variables. So if we just run pulled OLS, well, it doesn't estimate the fixed effect AI. So pulled OLS just runs this regression here, yit equals alpha plus beta xit, which means in the error term then, we have this composite error, we've got the emitted fixed effect and then the error term here. So in order for OLS in this model to be consistent, we need both of these variables to be uncorrelated with x. So the classical example is where x is what years of schooling and y is wages. We know in that case that alpha i, for example, will include ability. So ai hasn't got a t subscript, it's time invariant. You can think of this as all variables which are the same for a person over time or a country or, or a firm. Um, so for example, it would include things like gender and so on. But in this particular case, if we had wage on school, then this would be ability. So we know straight away if we do pulled OLS in this regression here, then we're going to get a bias. Now, if we just have a cross section, then there's nothing we can do about that because all we can ever do is regress Y upon X and we've got N observations. So we can see this AI, there are going to be N of them. So we can see the only way that we can get around this is if we've got a panel where we observe the same people over time. So if we believe that the um, on the fixed effect or this unobserved heterogeneity is correlated with this and we know OLS is biased. So the first difference and fixed effect estimators, they're both transformations of the regression that remove AI. So remember, first difference literally just takes differences on both sides, in which case change in YIT is beta change in XIT plus, and we can see because the AI is fixed over time, the error term just becomes change in UIT. So this is the first difference transformation. And in this case, we're going to have now n times t minus 1 observations. We're going to lose now the first observation point. Okay, so we can see in this case, we still, in this particular case, now it doesn't matter if AI is correlated with X, because we've now transformed it, we've sweeped it out of the regression. So if, as long as the XIs are uncorrelated with, or if, as long as all the Xs are uncorrelated with the Us, then this OLS regression here, first difference will be uh, consistent. The, fi the fixed effects transformation is similar. Instead of si instead of subtracting off the last observation, we subtract we subtract the average y i dot, where y i dot is the average of y over time. One over t sigma t equal one to t y i t. In this case, again, now we're going to get beta x i t. So this now the regressor is a deviation of x i t from the average. So it's the deviation of x from its time average. And now the error term becomes a deviation of the error from the time average. And again, because the AI is fixed, then the average of AI is also the same and therefore we've removed it from the regression. So we covered this in the lecture and we can see that the, the main downside of this is that we lose degrees of freedom. It's not. It's obvious. It's obvious in the first difference because you can see we lose the first sample point, but in the fixed effects, it also is equivalent to lose the degrees of freedom as also n times t minus one. And the reason is is that we've still got to estimate these averages here, so this reduces our degrees of freedom, and we can actually show that the fixed effects estimator is equivalent to running this regression here where we estimate all of the intercepts AI for each person. So we can see there are, n, there are n parameters to estimate here. So again, we can show that fixed effect is equivalent to the least squares dummy variable approach, which just runs the regression in the level and it estimates an intercept for each person. So the least squares dummy variable approach estimates the intercept for each person. So it allows people's abilities to be different and so on. Okay. So we don't need to, you don't need to be able to prove that, but you need to know the result. Okay, so the fixed effects, the random effect, the, the, one, the, the, the whole point of random effect is that even if the endogeneity, even if the exogeneity assumption holds, so even if the AI is on collate with X, then we can just use pulled OLS because it will still be consistent. But the problem is, is that just like as we saw in lecture two, we're going to have a grouping. We've now got a classic grouping problem where now the errors, even though they are uncorrelated with AI, will now have a, uh, a, a correlation driven between the errors. <clears throat> so the random effects, again, it requires the same assumptions as um, pooled OLS. We need XIT to be uncorrelated with the error and we need XIT to be uncorrelated with AI. 
So again, it, under these assumptions, pooled OLS is also consistent, but it will be inefficient because we're gonna have this grouping in the O. So if you remember back to lecture two, we gave example of like people in the same classroom and so on. We now have got this grouping so we can see if AI varies, it's not the same for everyone, then VIT, which is AI plus UIT, is going to be correlated with VIT minus one and so on and all other time periods. So we can see even though it's going to be consistent, if the AI varies across people, namely it doesn't get sucked into the constant, then we're going to have a correlation between the error terms. So all random effects does is in essence it develops a method. Remember we saw three, four different methods in lecture two that we can use to get around the serial correlation that's driven by this grouping of observations. So again, even though it's con even though it's uncorrelated with X, it will it will drive a correlation between the error terms, and therefore we can get a more efficient estimate than pulled our less by transforming the model, in essence, working out what the correlation is between this and then making a transformation like weighted least squares, like generalized least squares, that will make it so that the new error terms in our transform regression are uncorrelated. Then once you run OLS in this transformed regression, now the errors are both uncorrelated with X and they've also got no serial correlation between them. Therefore, the Gauss-Markov assumption will hold. Okay, so this just, the next slide 25, just repeat. So we saw this in lecture two and we've seen the intuition. We can see straight away that the errors for the same person are gonna be correlated across time because of this common shock yeah, sorry, so this here, yeah, yeah, this, this, sometimes they use AI, sometimes it uses alpha I. But again, the, the labeling is irrelevant here. It's just the, the main thing is that this is, the main thing is, is that you've got some variable that's fixed across time, which drives, which is emitted, and is in the error term, and it's causing an error between the, um, between the shocks. So the next slide, so sorry, yeah, yeah, we, we've used, we use, we've used, the, it still uses AI here, but yeah, we did, we did use alpha on the first on the first slide, but yeah, I'm referring to the same, the same thing. So the next slide just formalizes this. The next slide just works out, okay, well, what is the correlation between these errors given this common shock AI or alpha I? Okay, so let's just put it as AI. And then, okay, so we, we've actually seen, we've actually seen the next slide in, in lecture two. We worked out the correlate, we, we made, we made a lot of simplifying assumptions. So remember the molten factor we make the assumption that basically everything else is uncorrelated, it's got the same variance throughout time and so on. So we make all the usual assumptions, but all that's left is that the AI is gonna drive the correlation. So we can see then, well, the next slide, so we've seen this before, just to recap. So the next slide, okay, well, what's the, what's the correlation between the shocks in two different time periods, T and S? So again, we just plug in the shocks in both time periods and then we expand it out so we've missed some steps here but we're going to get four terms so you, you multiply them all together and the only terms so remember ai expect we've already assumed that the covariance of we've already assumed that the errors are uncorrelated with alpha it and we've, we always assume that the mean of the errors is not so this just means that e of ai e of um ai times uit equals not so when you expand this out, you're gonna get four terms, and the only one that doesn't equal naught is gonna be the AI squared, the expectation of it. So we've already assumed this by the and the exogeneity. I don't know why the pen's not working. The we've already assumed this by the um One second, it's crashed. Um, okay, so we've already, when you, when you expand this out, you're gonna get four terms. We've already assumed that this term is not because we've assumed that UI and A are uncorrelated with each other. And again, if we also assume that the, 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 the shocks UI are uncorrelated, so all this is saying is, even if these UIs are uncorrelated with each other, and even if the AI is uncorrelated with you, we're always gonna have a correlation between the shock because of this common shock here. That's all that this says here. 
you could generalize this and see what would happen if this wasn't not but we know we can see already if the if the UIs are on T are on collated then of course then the arrows are already on collated to begin with and therefore we would, we would have needed to use generalized least squares anyway so this just says even if you make lots of nice assumptions we assume everything is uncorrelated it's got the same variance it's exogenous we're still going to have a correlation between the errors we can also work out what's the variance so again you just plug in expand it out you're going to get now three terms we're assuming again the ai and the uit are uncorrelated so only two terms are going to come out here non not and again we just assume that all these are the same throughout time okay so then we can work out what's the correlation well you use the formula so the correlation is the covariance divided by the standard deviation of each and we've just worked out this above so again making the simplifying assumptions that this is that this we can see straight away if the u and a have got the same correlation throughout time then this is just constant throughout time okay so we can see then that we can we then derive what the correlation is under this so again this the random effect makes all these assumptions that the uis are uncorrelated with each other and that the v, the vari and that vi has got the same variance throughout time under that assumption then we can derive what the correlation is so then that's really it we can we, this is called row in stator all we need to do now is we can now form a generalized least squares estimator which just uses the fact that we know what the correlation is it transforms the regression and it makes a new error beyond correlate with each other so random effects is basically just generalized least squared applied in this particular context where we make these simplifying assumptions here Okay, and when we use data, it actually estimates it for you. It estimates the variance of A and it estimates the variance of U. So again, you need to know how to calculate this using the data output. And that's going to be one of the um, exam questions that we're going to cover. Okay, so you don't need to be able to prove this, but we can show, you can work out the generalized least squares transformation. Namely, you, you, we, all we're going to do is subtract off some proportion of the average of yi bar and remember yi bar is just the time average of y okay so again and we can estimate all this so if we take this transformation so all we've done is subtracted lambda yi bar from both sides so it's going to subtract lambda b naught lambda xit beta bar and lambda times the uh, the, the vi bar Okay, so we've demeaned now, we've, we've quasi demeaned the data, so we've not fully demeaned it. We can see if lambda equals 1, we've just got fixed effects. And if lambda equals not, we're back to the standard pooled OLS. So we can see that the random effect is going to be somewhere between the OLS, the pooled OLS, and the fixed effect um, estimator. Okay, so we can see now why, unless when lambda is between 0 and 1, we can see that the error term still includes this some fraction of this um, unobserved heterogeneity AI. So we can see we still need AI to be uncorrelated with X because it's still in the error term. Okay, but what we can show is, is that now the, on, with this particular lambda here, what we can show is, is that the correlation of VIT and VIS will now be not. Okay, so it relies crucially on estimating this term um, here. Okay, so random effects, it needs you, it needs the xi to be consistent. It needs x as, as always. We need x uncorrelated with 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 um with u, and we need x to be uncorrelated with the unobserved fixed effect. That gives us the consistency. If the if then the rest of the error ui is serially uncorrelated and there's heteroscedasticity, homoscedasticity, all the variants are the same, then this will be the particular transformation that will give us then um, an efficient um, OLS estimator. If, if, there was, if there was a heteroscedasticity as well, if there was a change in the variance of A or U, or the, there was a serial correlation they used, then we'd have to generalize this method. We need to then also do a weighted least squares type approach. We need to generalize and and then come up with a more general estimate. Okay, but this is a standard random effect estimate that is estimated in stator. Okay, so we just repeat there. So we can see then lambda equals one, it's fixed effect. And if lambda equals not, then the we get to um, uh, first uh, pooled OLS. So this is how you run it in stator. X T reg y y is your um, independent variable x is your aggressors re is for the random effects 
and then within here for example in the in the panel income dy dynamic survey normally this is the identifier so it's how the people are identified so when you see something in here it could be like countries or so on it's, it's the variables it's, it's the numbers that we give to all the different individuals in the sample so again you'd, you'd be given you wouldn't this is kind of in terms of exam type questions you'd just be given it it'd be done for you but if you're doing it yourself then when you download data, it normally tells you how we identify the people, and within there, you'll put how we identify the countries or, or the people. Okay, so again, we can see as lambda goes to one, then the bias will go to naught, and that's because remember, within the error term is one minus lambda ai. So we can see if there is a correlation between a and x, then we're going to get a bias, but the bias is going to be decreasing as lambda gets near to one. So if you do random effect and lambda say 0.99 or 0.9 even, then the, in, in essence it's going to have a very small bias anyway, even if it has, um, even if it is biased. Okay, so this just gives an example then. So again, so we saw this data. So again, in this particular case, the label of the ID is PID. So all it's done is regress. So we've got the Y. These are all our X variables and it just picked the sample two. So again, it was if, so the if just it's just restricted the sample in this case. I think this is taken just men in this sample. Um, this is just taking a particular particular wave in the, because in, in the waves there'll be kind of many, many waves, so they've particularly just taken one particular wave here. So we've got a GLS random effect, GLS regression, number of observations, number of groups, which is the number of people here, and so on. Okay, so it's very similar, and again, as all it's telling you here, we've assumed that the AI is uncorrelated with X, which we've already seen, we need to do that. And the down beneath here is how we estimate this row. So again, this we can estimate, so we can use these two to estimate the, the, the correlation between the two variables. And we're gonna see that in one of the exam questions. So as always, you've got your regressors, you've got the coefficient estimate, you've got your standard errors, and you can do a t-test, okay? So we're going, to, we're going to see an example in the, we're going to see an example in one of the exam questions. Okay, so this just repeats, as always, crucial assumption for um, consistency, AI is uncorrelated with X. If not, then RE will be biased. It'll be biased, but it will, so fixed effects won't be biased, random effects will. And there's, there's really a trade-off, because even though fixed effects and first difference won't be biased, if AI is correlated, the problem is, is that you're reducing a lot of the variation in XI. So when you regress YIT, let's say you do pulled OLS and you regress Y on X. Well, when you do this regression, although it could be biased, we have not we have variation both on the cross-section dimension and the time series dimension. So normally o OLS will have a smaller variance, but the downside is that it's likely to be biased. For example, when you regress change in YIT on change in XIT, well, here you've removed now the variation. You've removed a lot of the time variation, and likewise, when you when you do fixed effects and you regress the deviation of y from its mean on the deviation of x from its mean, then you've removed now the variation that's coming across time. And often, and so the problem here is one of the downsides of these methods is if most of the variation comes on the time dimension and not on the cross section dimension. So, for example, if you've got a variable which maybe it doesn't vary that much um, across the people, but changes a lot over time. Well, the problem with this is that you can get, although although this transformation will mean that you get rid of the bias, it can have a very, very small, it can have a very large variant on your on your estimator. So that's one of the downsides of um, doing the, the, the differencing type approach. Okay, <clears throat> so the Hausman test, just is a, a, a test which allows us to work to test the hypothesis that AI is not correlated with X, namely that FI is consistent against the alternative that FE is not. So in the, under the null hypothesis, FE is consistent and RE is consistent. So I should have said first, we're testing the not sorry, the, the null here. So FE is always consistent, whether or not AI is correlated with X. The null hypothesis is testing that RE is consistent, but just to make clear under the null, fixed effects is consistent and RE is consistent, but under the alternative, well, FE is still consistent because it doesn't matter if AI is correlated with X, but now RE is inconsistent. 
So under the null hypothesis, then the difference between the random effects and the fixed effects should be very near to each other. If the null isn't true, then they'll not be the same, and as a sample size, and then, then there'll be a difference between the two as the sample gets bigger. So all this, the 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 the, 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 the Hausman test is namely just a wall test, and this it turns out we've not proven this. We can show that the ver under the null hypothesis, because of this consistency, we can show that the variance of beta hat minus beta g is just equal to the difference in the variance. So th this is not this result doesn't hold in general. You know when you do this, you can have a covariance term as well. So but we, this is a result you can prove. I mean, we've not proved it on this course, you, but you can read it if you want in the textbooks and follow the, the proof. So this follows under the null only. So under the null hypothesis, this is the case. And again, as always, you always work out the distribution of the test statistic under the null, because we're assuming that the null isn't true. And what we can show is, is as the sample size gets bigger, it becomes a chi-squared k, where k is equal to the number of x variables. Okay, so it's just a wall test where the variance takes a simpler form. So it's a wall test where we can show the variance looks like this. Okay, and again, state has got an automatic command um, that runs the Hausman test. Okay, so we can see, and again, as I said, under the null, we can show that this is the variance and it's positive definite, which is all that this says here. So as I said, under the null, under the null hypothesis, because both random effects and fixed effects are, are both consistent, then they're both converging to beta naught. So under the null, they both converge to the true parameter. So for large sample sizes under the null, they should be near to each other. So you're only gonna get a deviation. There are, for, for, for bigger sample sizes, this, this differential in the betas, of the different estimates, will only be non naught if the null isn't true. Namely, if A is correlated with X, then the fixed effects will be consistent, but the random effects will be biased, and therefore the difference will be non-zero as the sample gets bigger. Okay, so under the null, this holds. So therefore, the difference between them, <coughs> the difference between them, should be near to not. Okay, so the next one does this. This quietly just means that it doesn't print out the outputs. So again, you just do the regression. You've saved it and store it as FE1. And then you do random effects instead of as a RE1. So all this is done is you just run two regressions. You've given them a name, so you stored them as a variable. Quietly just means not to. You can quietly just means don't print out the results. Then the command is Hausman, and then the regression you've saved for the FE, and the regression that you've saved for the RE1. Okay, and it gives you down here at the bottom here. So again, it's worked out the statistic, and then it it, 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 it as always. The member under, under the null hypothesis, it's got a chi-squared distribution, which will look like this, and you then work out the critical region. So there'll be some critical value, which it works out for you, and then this is your rejection region. So remember, as always, the idea of a test, this is the distribution of the test statistic under the null. So this is the distribution of the Hausman test statistic if H0 is true. What this means is, if we did the test again and again and again, this is how many, this this is this is the size that the statistic would take. So we know that the the difference between them, the, the difference between beta hat W and beta hat G should be not sorry should be small. But again, it's a random variable, <coughs> so it won't always be it won't always be not. And this is a probability that the statistic, well, the, namely this statistic, takes the values given here. So again, we know that the, the bigger the statistic is, the bigger this differential is, and therefore the less likely the null is to be true. And this is then the rejection region. So that's, so that's just the usual idea of a test. We only reject if the, sample, if, the, if, the test, if the test statistic is sufficiently large enough for us to say that it's highly unlikely that we would have observed both of these estimates if the null was true. Because if the null was true, they should be near to each other. Okay. So that's that's it really. So I think it's relative. I think it's the in terms of the idea, random effect, namely, is it's just OLS where we make the usual assumptions that all the emitted variables are correlated with X, but we just do a transformation to then remove the serial correlation in the errors by doing generalized least squares. There's another method that we can also use called the correlated random effects estimator, and what this does, it assumes that the unobserved AI takes this form here, namely, it says that the unobserved effect equals a constant, plus
plus gamma xi bar and then ri is then the residual where we assume ri is uncorrelated with xi bar. So we can see straight away if this assumption holds well you can plug in ai and now this be would become the new error term and the, so that we can see here we can actually run this regression because we observe x and we observe xi bar so if the covariance of xit and uis equals not for all t and s because remember we need uit now to be uncorrelated with the xit and all of the x's because xit includes all of the x's sorry xi bar includes all is an average of all the x's So we can see here then, under this assumption, if, the, so that we, if this correlated random effect assumption holds and the RI is uncorrelated with all the X's, then this new regression will consistently estimate beta. So that's really it. And then, so the only difference is, is that we include, so if we, and what we can show is, if we apply the random effects estimator to this model, that it, it will be, it's, a, it's equivalent to running fixed effects. And again, we don't prove this, but it's called the Mondelec trick namely that if we add if we run this regression here namely we'll regress y on xit and the average of x if we run random effects in this regression what we can show is is that the correlated random effects estimator is equivalent to the this random effects in this model here okay so we can see that if, if we run ols here then under this assumption that RI is on college with XI bar, then in this particular case, we've included the AI, so we've controlled for it, and now the error term are both on college with all of the regressors, and so we can see straight away that this model will be consistent. And if we run random effects on this, because random effects in this model is equivalent to fixed effects, and we, we can also see here that this will be um, um, consistent as well, because we know fixed effects is always um, consistent. So again, you don't need to be able to prove this, but it's a famous result that if we run random effects in this particular regression here, it is equivalent to the fixed effects um, estimator. Okay. So we can then test. So we can do this, and we can often use this to test. And we can see intuitively here that if we had omitted some AI variable, then we can see if xi bar, if we run this regression and the gammas, if some of the gammas are not, well, this is telling us that yi is related to some time invariant variables. So we can see, even intuitively here, if we run this regression and gamma doesn't equal naught, then we know if we run the pooled OLS, well, this would be in the error term, and therefore we need to control for them. So when we run this, if we, if we regress y on x and the averages, it will give us an idea of whether or not the, the, the assumption that ai is uncorrelated with xi is likely to hold. And this is another way we can do the Hausman test, namely... We need this to hold, but we can see if we if we if AI has this form, then we know if we if we include XI bar and gamma is not not, then we know if we hadn't if we don't include if we don't control for AI somehow, then we're going to get a bias, and that's all that this does on the next um, regression. It just defines all these new variables here. So again, all it's done is just all this does is to make all of the XI bars and then includes them in the regression. So all this next one has done is <coughs> it's regressed wages on all the X's. The A just means the average. It includes all the averages. So these are all the XI's. And these are all the XI bars. Okay. <coughs> so we can then see, we can already see straight away that some of these T statistics are very large. This is telling us that it's likely that the manual worker um, variable and the covered variable are both, the average of them is both highly correlated with YI. Namely, if we don't include these variables, and of course we're going to omit them, we're going to be in the, in the error term. And they've got the sign that we expect as well, because we'd expect that being a manual worker, they're likely, we know that they earn a lot less on average, and that oh, it makes sense that the average output for the average wage of the manual worker is going to be lower for, for, for the average person who is a manual worker, they're going to have lower wages. Okay, so that makes sense. And when we include when we include this manual 
if we want to include this average, we then find that the effect of being a manual worker has disappeared. So in the earlier slide, when we didn't control for these extra variables, then we found a very strong negative coefficient on being a manual worker. The reason being is that we've omitted some time invariant variables that namely manual workers are possibly they're, they're working in lower income jobs, they've possibly got a lower education and so on, and therefore they're less likely to earn as much. And it kind of makes sense that there's no reason why being a manual worker in itself should mean that you earn less once you've controlled for everyone's personal characteristics. I think it also makes sense as well that there's no direct effect of being a manual worker on your wages once you control for all of the personal characteristics of a person. Okay, so that's what that's done here. And again, this is we can then we can also do a child test here. We can we can also do the the Hausman test here, test at the coefficients and all these are not, and it's exactly the same as the Hausman test. So this is another way of doing the Hausman test is to include all the averages and then just do a joint test that the coefficients on all these variables are not. Okay, these become omitted because of course these are the same over time. So again, these come these drop out. Okay. So that's it. For, that's it in terms of the random effects. So the big the big um, downside to fixed effects and first difference well it reduces the sample um, size. And it can reduce the well. It reduces it reduces the variation in your regressor, especially if most of the variance is coming across the time dimension. Okay, the the downside of using and another another downside is that we can't include variables that are constant um, throughout time. So if you use first effects, if you use first effects or first differences, and you include a variable x i t say gender or so on that doesn't change throughout time. Then when you difference, it's gonna it's gonna come out again. So if you then do, so you, the, 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 there are some of the main that it also can cause problems when you have um, missing data. But the, the, they're the three main ones. It reduces the sample size. It reduces the variation in your regressors, especially if most of the variance is across time. And in the extreme case, if the if the x variable of interest is time invariant, then we can't include it, and therefore you can't estimate the coefficient on it. And that's what this just says um, here. Okay. So the benefits, whereas random effects doesn't have that problem, so random effects allows you to include time invariant variables, and it doesn't remove all of the variation across time. It just removes part of it, and it, the downside is though is that it relies on the exogeneity assumption on AI. So the benefit of random effects is that it's more efficient, but it can be biased if the um, AI is correlated with XIT. Okay, so that's really it for, for, the, um, for the random effects estimator. So we can move on now and do some uh, exam questions. So let me just get rid of this. So one of the questions relates to random effects. So we'll do, um, Let's do the other one first. Okay, so this <clears throat> you've you've seen the solution to this. I would, we're just going to run. I would not. It's not to run through all the the nitty gritty, but just to run through the idea. And you can ask any questions in terms of the um, the solutions and so on. But we have. So again, you've got a chance of four questions from six, and we're going to cover. Well, let's do question one. So, a researcher is interested in analysing the marriage wage premium for men. They've got access to two waves of panel in 2000 and 2016. So it's defined the variables, log of real pay, a dummy for married, and wave 16 equal one if the year is 2006 and not otherwise. And it's given you state output on pages eight to 13, where the sample is restricted just to men. Okay, so that gives you all the information there. So we then have the pooled, um, let's get this way. So we have then the, so part A, tells us then that we've run a pooled OLS regression and which given as the output in the in the slide at the end where y is log of our pay and x is married okay so we've got over i for an i so i indicates individual and t is time so examine the output of this regression in in the stator output and carefully discuss how to interpret the OLS estimator of beta hat one okay well here in this particular case xi is a dummy variable so again, when you run this, when you do this, let's for question one A.
So one A. Well, so we run Y I T on A I on A plus beta X I T plus they called it VIT on this one sec. So they called it VIT. Well, in this particular case, we talked this in the regret in the lecture. So in this particular case, the 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 the, the interpretation on beta one. Well, if we assume that because in this particular case, when we assume that e of UIT given XIT equals not. Well, x i t only takes two values, so this implies that e of u i t given x i t equals one equals e of u i t given x i t equals not. So then we can then use this to then work out what's the interpretation on the beta one. Well, if you apply this, this just means that e of y i t given x i t equals one is alpha plus beta one, because the mean of this given x is not, and likewise, for x equals not, well in that case, the, the beta drops out because the, it's, the x is not, and we just get alpha. So we can see, and again, we saw this in, this is, this is a special case with a difference in difference, so we can see that beta is just the difference between the two. So under the exogeneity assumption, then we can show that the beta is just the difference in the averages of the y for both people that are um, married and not married. So xi here is married. So we can then, when, so in this particular case, and again we talked about this in the lecture, the, the OLS estimate, well, as always, the, using the method of moment approach, all you do is you replace the population average with the sample average. So we can see here using, because the OLS is just a method of moment, the method of moment just replaces population averages with sample averages. So we're just going to have the average of y, i, t for x equal 1 minus the average of y i t for x equal not and we can show that this is 0 0.23 okay so this is given to you in the in the state output at the end so that's the we've estimated b to one so the next part then is the, i think there's a the more the uh, <coughs> The more substantial part of this question is, can beta hat 1 be interpreted as a causal effect of being married? So as always, well, in order for it to be causal, we need this to hold here. We need that ui is mean independent of x. So the question is, is there any other variable which drives wages that is correlated with whether somebody's married? And if it is, is it likely to be positively or negatively correlated? Well, we can see here that it's highly unlikely that the exogeneity assumption will hold Namely, we've not included things like their education level, their me other measure of their productivity or their ability, and possibly it would be the case that people that uh, are married, they could, for example, find other, they may, they may be more inclined to get people in their similar income group and so on, and they're also possibly, on average, maybe likely to be higher earners or more productive than people that don't get married. And again, I guess there's often a kind of social status to being married as well, that people that get married tend to, on average, tend to probably be more successful than people that are not. And again, I guess the, there's, the, there's also the case that the, there's, there'll be many, many reasons why marriage will be correlated with lots of different people's personal characteristics. It's unlikely that all of these are going to be uncorrelated with marriage. And in the case, probably likely the case that people that are married are probably going to be earning more on average because they're likely more educated or they're more productive to begin with and therefore they seek out and they find someone also in their similar income group and so on. Okay, so the main thing is that you make clear what the exogeneity assumption is and you then give some, and there's no right or wrong, you, you could make a case that there wasn't um, um, an omitted variable bias, but you'd have to make a strong case. I think it's likely that it is and you just have to give some example of what, the, what this variable may be and is it likely to be positively or negatively um, correlated. So, the, I mean, I didn't, I didn't teach this because the solutions also said that, in the, in the sketch solutions, it's also said that the, there could also be a, a serial correlation in the errors from the fixed effect. 
Well, that's the case, but the question asks us whether beta hat 1 can be interpreted as causal, namely, does the exogeneity assumption hold? So that's kind of separate to the issue of there being an inefficiency here. So I wouldn't have been, this was someone else's, that, that, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have been looking for that in, in, the, in the answer. You wouldn't have lost any marks, but the key point was to make out, if you look at the solutions, the key point was to make the exogeneity case or not. Okay, so the next, so the next part 1b, again to ask any questions if you've got any, so 1b then, so again, so it's likely that there are some characteristics which are staying the same over time which are going to be correlated to whether or not someone's married. Maybe on average they're likely to be more productive overall and they're more likely to find then someone in a similar income bracket or similar that will also um, to, to, to get married. So then we can see then what this means then if we have whatever these variables are if there are some time invariant variables call them ai then we know if we run this regression so again if we do the pooled ols the ai goes in the error so the first difference then the change in yi which is just this is the notation that they've used here but again it's just yi t minus yt minus one equals beta one change in xi plus change in u i. Okay, so examine the output of this question carefully and comment on the difference between the two. So again, you should be linking this then to your answer before. So we can see, again, if you look at the data, if you look at the data output at the end, we can see that the new estimate, the beta hat one fixed effect is equal to 0 0.0968. So we can see then that this is quite substantially smaller than the 0 0.23. And it also, con so this is the OLS and this is the first difference. So we can see the estimate. We can see then that the first difference is over half, as, is, is at least 50% or more less than the, oh, sorry, 100% less, it's half the size or less than the, or, than the OLS estimate. And this is going in the direction that we hypothesize we, we hypothesize that there's likely to be some characteristics which mean that married people are probably more likely to earn more on average. And we can see that once we've differenced these out, we've actually got a much smaller um, estimate on the return to being married or not. So this then corresponds to our idea that there likely are some personal characteristics that have omitted. And we've at least, we may not have removed all of them. There could still be some time varying variables which will be correlated with X, but we've at least removed the time invariant ones and we can see that this has reduced the, the the estimate okay so what are the benefits and shortcomings well the key benefit is that it's more likely that this is going to be uh, unbiased or at least it should reduce the bias even if it's not removed it it should remove it should reduce the bias the downside is that the standard error is increased and you can see that so if you look at the the if you look at the standard error, it's much larger for the fixed effects than the than the, um, than the pulled OLS. And you can see this, that you can, in your answer, you'd also been expected to refer to, so it gives you a table at the back, and it tells you what percentage of people have changed category of marriage. So remember, when you do, when you do first difference, as we said earlier, change in XIT, you've now reduced some of the variation in XIT, namely, it, remember going back to the exercise two, it relies on there being a lot of switches. Namely, we the bigger, there'll be more variation in X, the more people that change marriage status. So in the extreme case, if, if everybody stayed married, then there'd be no, or didn't get married, then there'd be no change. These, all, these would all equal not. So we only get switches, namely change in XIT equals one, if they become married, and change in XIT equals minus one if they get divorced. And there's only a small fraction of people that change over the time, around 12.38% or get divorced. So we expect then that we expect there to be a large increase in the standard errors because you've reduced now the variation in your regressor. So this is again the classic downside of first difference. If most of your variation is coming across the um, time dimension as opposed to the people dimension then you're going to then inflate your standard errors okay 
and in, in, in essence, a, a large standard error is just as bad as a bias, namely, let's just say, let's just take two hypothetical examples. Let's just say you've got one estimate, which is, um, which is let's say this is a true parameter. You may have one in the distribution of, you may have one estimate which is biased, but which has got a small variance. And you may have another estimator which is unbiased, but has got a large variance. And you can see, we'd actually prefer, it, and this is obviously just an arbitrary example, we'd actually prefer this estimator to the unbiased one because actually it's nearer to beta naught than the other one. So again, having a large variance is can be as bad as having a uh, a bias. So again, there's always a trade-off between the two between the two models. Just because you use first difference, you've, you've you've you can reduce the bias or removed it, but you can you could have caused a bigger problem by making your inference too weak. Okay. So that was the main thing to pick up there. So you'd be expected to state the the to, to state the fixed effects first difference estimate and its standard error, compare it to the OLS, make it clear that it's re, it's likely to reduce the bias, and then it also the direction makes sense because we hypothesize a positive bias, and then also to link the reason as to why the variance has increased is because there's only a small amount of people that are actually changing, the, the regress is only changing for a small amount of people, and therefore you have then got a much smaller, effectively your sample size is smaller or you've reduced then, you've reduced the um, the efficiency of your estimate. Okay, so they're, they're the main things you'd be expected to say um, that. Final one then is fixed effects. So the research uses pulled OLS, fixed effects and first different to estimate this regression here. So this one is included X and now a time dummy as well. Discuss the differences in data transformation and assumption underlying fixed effects and random effects estimate. So this is in essence relatively standard textbook type and the solutions go through this. It's pretty much what we just said. So we know all you, all you need to do is state what fixed effects is, namely it's yit minus yi bar. So you just need to give the details on how you do it basically. So you can have beta xit minus xi bar plus delta d2t minus d2 bar plus okay so you regress this there on your transform variables and you run OLS here and you've also got random effects so again you just need to state how you do it so again random effects demeans the data this quasi demeaning this lambda we subtract off not just the, the full average but the some proportion of it Plus, sorry, lambda, and then okay, and you've got this composite error here, where and again need to state the assumption for this to work, namely, so we run this where the lambda is this one minus square root of sigma squared u which is the variance of u divided by sigma so this just estimates the correlation between the shocks now okay so you just need to give some detail on how you do this so again you can do stator you estimate these you get the estimate lambda hat one minus square root lambda hat squared u divided by lambda hat So you just estimate these, you can get them in state using, using the, the two-way command, lambda. Okay, and that's it. So then fix, and you can make clear then, so the relationship between the two, well, this lambda is between naught and one. By definition, we can see that the, 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 the numerator here is at least as big as the, is smaller than, is always smaller, or at least of the same size as the denominator. So we can see how they're related then. Well, we know straight away for lambda equals naught, we get to pooled OLS. And for lambda equals one, we're back to fixed effects. So that the random effects is just some it's just somewhere between the two. Okay, so then it asks you to compare across the models. And again, pooled OLS. So again, that so that that's the main comparison um, between the two. And you can calculate then, you can calculate the the, so the notes go through this. You can use the um, output to estimate this this um, row hat coefficient. So 
So you can show that lambda hat is equal to 0 0.1985 from the state output at the back. So again, the notes run through this. So you can actually say how we'd actually estimate it in the particular example. So you then have to then compare the two. So we might, it, the last part is then asking us to say which model should we choose and why. Well, we wouldn't want to use pooled OLS because we've already found that the um, the fix the first difference estimator is much smaller, and we've already hypothesized that it's likely there'll be a positive bias in pooled OLS. So the only thing that's left to then verify is should we use fixed effects or should we use um, random effects? Well, we need to then test between the two, so you can do the Hausman test. And you've got to then do this from the information that we're being given. So in this particular case, we're going to use the Mundlat trick. So namely, so you're given, so this is for part A. So this is just beta hat 1 from pooled OLS. This is what we'd then use to see. This then just gives you the, the next part then. So this, again, this links to part 1B, where these this is people that get divorced. So just to link it to the, these are people that get married. And these to stay the same so we can see there's only a small proportion of people 15% that actually have an X that changes over time and we, we can see then when we look at this then so we can see this is the first first difference estimator and the standard error is now 0.28 whereas before it was 0.2 so there's actually there's only been a small increase in the standard error here so we can see that the standard errors are quite similar it's a bit bigger for first difference and we can see that they're quite small so namely the fact that the first difference is over 0.12 smaller well that's around six times the standard error so it's highly likely that's come from random variation namely what I'm saying by that is if just because the first difference estimator is smaller if the standard errors were huge well that could just come by random variation so because the standard errors are quite small relative to the coefficient because the coefficient has halved, then more than halved, then it's likely that this has come from a bias. There's some emitted variable here. Okay. So the next part then gives you the output. So then we want to then test, we want to then be able to test for whether or not the, we should use random effects or fixed effects. So it gives you all the estimated outputs here and what all this, the, the relevant, the relevant, the relevant, um, where is it here? Yeah, so the relevant output here to test, well, this is just run, remember the correlated random effects estimator. All it's done is to generate a variable of average married. It's then included that as a regressor. And we can see, so we know then that in this particular case, this regression then, if in order, in order for the um, random effects estimator to be used, then we want the coefficient on this to be not, namely that we've not omitted something out. So all we've done here is just include alpha plus, we've got x plus delta, say, xi bar plus epsilon it. All we do is test delta equal not. So this, remember, this is equivalent to the Hausman test. Namely, if this regression doesn't include ai, namely, if we, if we run pulled OLS, it will only work if delta is not. Because if we do pulled OLS, we don't include change in xi. Um, t. So we can see we need delta to be naught. We want to test that the coefficient here is naught, and we can see the t start is 3.66. So we, we would reject the null at conventional levels. At the 1% level, we'd find evidence to reject the null. This is telling us then that it's unlikely that the um, it's unlikely that the error, omitted variables are uncorrelated with x. And we can see there's a positive correlation, which is what we expected. There's a positive correlation between the average married and wages. Okay, so it all makes sense. So the, 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 when we emit that variable, then we're finding a strong effect on married, not because it's necessarily the causal effect, but because we've emitted some characteristics about the average married person, which means that they're earning a lot more. Okay, so in this particular case, then we would, well, it would suggest to use a fixed effects, but, um, and again, there's actually not much, there's actually not, um, This would suggest to use fixed effects because fixed effects removes this bias. The downside of fixed effect is that we've increased the standard errors, but we've only increased it by a small amount. So the fixed effects had errors at standard errors around 0 0.02, and they're around point sorry yeah, and they're around 0 0.028 here. 
So, that, I mean, that is, it has increased quite a bit, but relative to the size of the coefficient, it's actually still quite small, and it's likely that we're going to get incorrect inference from the uh, fixed effects. Okay? From, from, ran, from, from um, random effects, sorry. Okay? So we can see the random effects, the random effect estimate, which is given here, I think. Yeah, so the random effect estimate we can see for random effects, the, the standard error is 0 0.0199. So in this, for random effects, it's likely that this model is biased. We can see that there is still a large coefficient on point on, on married, but the standard error is smaller, which you'd expect because it's more efficient, but it's not that much smaller. And we can see that the, the, uh, the fixed effects coefficient is around half of this. And it can it's unlikely it's been explained by this random variation. So overall, we'd prefer the fixed effects um, estimator. Okay. So let's then do another question then. Let's do question three. So the first part, so this was a difference in difference um, question. So a researcher wants to analyze how differences in earnings between union and non-union members evolved over time. She has access to two waves for years 95 and 2005, and she estimates these two models. Again, so that you can think of these as your um, unrestricted model here. So you can have a, this, this would be the restricted model. You force the coefficient on XI to be the same in all waves. And here, you've got your unrestricted. So you've let the coefficient differ between the two time periods. So y is log hourly wage, and x is a dummy variable that takes a value 1 if the person is a union member, and 0 otherwise. Okay? So, that, they are two models. So, d, uh, d not 5 is a dummy variable. It takes a value 1, as I've already said, and we've got the stage output on pages 18 and 19. So, the first part, well, this is just a child test, and the notes go through this. Uh, remember, it's the usual formula. It's the sum of squared residuals in the unrestricted minus the restricted, sorry, restricted minus unrestricted, the restricted sum of square residuals is always going to be at least as big as the unrestricted divided by the number of degrees of freedom in the unrestricted model, which is just the, the sample size added together minus the number of estimates, number of parameters we estimate. So that's just two times the number of parameters because we've estimated two separate regressions divided by the sum of square of residuals in the unrestricted model divided by the number of restrictions Q. Okay, so you just do an F test here and you can work all this out from the information at the back and the notes actually go through this in quite a lot of detail here. So um, we can move on to the next part unless anyone's got any questions um, on this. And remember, the SSR in the restricted model is just the two uh, uh, in the in the in the restricted model. Sorry, the unrestricted model is just the SSR and both of these added together. So we just add this. If you have SSR one here and SSR two here, then you just add them together. Okay. Another way another way of thinking about this is actually to let the unrestricted. The reason another way to say it is is to just run a regression where we include the constant and x. And then we interact them with a the dummy for the, for the wave of 15 and we include both variables again. So you're going to have two times the number of parameters and you're just testing that the, co the, the joint coefficients on all these interaction terms are not. So that's another way of um, thinking about it. So the next part then. So this is just difference in difference. So this was from lecture 2. This is relatively standard question here. So we've got D or not 5 is the dummy for whether they're in time period five or not. Xi here is the treatment, and D, the, this is the interaction between the two. Okay, so this Xi is whether or not they're in a union or not at time period um, 15. So here, you just expect it to go through, and he, he, the, the solution to give the answer, but, the, but this relates to how do we interpret each of these coefficients. And remember, there's four different cases Let's just then do it here. So we've got four. So this is relatively textbook analysis here. We've got four. So let's just write it out. So we've got y, i, go down, da -da -da. 
y i equals alpha naught plus d naught five gamma naught. So again, you can work all these out from the information at the back, but the question also asks you how in detail how to interpret the parameters, the estimates of all these here. So we can see then, again, we assume that ui is exogenous, so it's uncorrelated with x and the time dummy d05. Well, you just work out e of yi for each of the four cases. Firstly, if d05, there's four different cases. You've got D05 can be one or not, and XI is a dummy, so that can be one or not. You can then work out what the conditional expectation is in each of the four quadrants, and then you can work out the interpretation of this coefficient here. Okay, so if you do D05, so this is time period, the first one, not the first one, um, XI equals not. Okay, so this is a person that's not in a this is a person that's not in a um, union, and um, so D not five takes one in two thousand. So this is a person in two thousand fifteen that's not in a union, and again, again, we're assuming UI is uncorrelated with all the variables. So this is just going to be alpha naught. So alpha naught is just the average for people for who for who both of these dummies are not. So this is the average for people that are in. Um, 2015 that are not in a union okay so that's what alpha naught is and again you can get that from the estimates at the end so it's given to you in this data output we can then do well what is e of four, four then when we have um say d naught five equal one so you're in time period 2015 and then not in a union well it's just which of these switch on or not in this particular case it's going to get alpha naught plus delta naught Okay, so delta naught is just a difference in the two. So delta naught is just the difference. So this is just the average earnings for people in 2015 who don't have a union membership relative to people in 2015 who also don't have a mem who also don't have a union membership. Okay, so this is just in essence the effect of the time. This is just the difference in the average earnings for people that are not in union between 2015 and 2001. Okay, you can then work out the rest. And what we can show is, is that this delta naught, sorry, I've missed out the, sorry, I've missed out the interaction term, plus um, delta one D naught. Nothing changes, because again, when, he, when, when at least one of them is not, then this term is equal to not anyway. Okay, so then we've got the other two then. So we've got E of Y, I. Okay, so we cover this in detail in lecture two. You've then got, well, what is the, we've got this when D, I, five, not five equals not, and X, I equals one. So this is just going to be alpha naught plus uh, beta one. Yeah, and then, so this is the average of income for people in 2015 that are in a union and then we've got the ones where both dummies switch on which is just them all added together okay so we can see then well you can firstly remove out the we want to interpret delta, so all you've got to do is just use algebraic manipulation to just difference out until you get back down to this. So we can see if we subtract this from this, we're going to be just left with delta naught plus um, delta naught plus delta one, and then we can just remove off the delta. Wait, what have I called the number? Wait, it's called um, alpha naught, delta naught, beta one, and delta one. So this should be an so we can remove off, where have I gone on with the, um, alpha naught plus, where have I gone, so this is the, anyway, so the difference, I've, I think I've done, a, I think I've done, can anyone see where, I think I've labeled on these wrong, so this is alpha naught, when this one equals one, so we're going to get de delta naught plus the two between the two, when d naught five equals naught and x five equals one, we're going to get alpha naught plus beta one,
Have I labelled something wrong here? Oh yeah, cut, cut, no, no, no. sorry, I'm being silly. We want delta one, not delta naught. Sorry. So we want to interpret. We already know, we want to interpret delta one. So, if you subtract one from the other, if you subtract this from this, so if we subtract the average income for people in 2015 in a union from people in the other time period that are also in a union. Well, this is just going to be delta naught plus delta one, and we can all we've already got delta naught from earlier. We can get delta naught by subtracting this from this. So okay, so we've just got if we subtract this from this. So if you get the difference, so this is the difference in the earnings for people that are in the unions in different time periods, and it then subtracts off the difference in the average income for people that are not in a union in different time periods. So this is just the treatment effect. So we can then see to get rid of delta naught, well we subtract off delta one. So delta one is going to be, well we've already got the above, this gives us delta naught plus delta one. Okay, and it gives us this different in the difference. This gives us, and then we then subtract off delta naught. Well, delta naught is just this difference above here. It's just, this is just, if you look at there, this is just the, sorry, D naught five. This is just the difference in the average incomes for unionized members between the two periods, minus off the difference in the average earnings for non-unionized members between the two periods. So remember, think of this as kind of the common trends assumption here. D naught five equal naught, XI equal naught. We're just subtracting off, the, we're just subtracting off the we want to, the the treatment now is whether they get in the union or not. So the difference in if there was no treatment effect, we'd expect this difference to be not. This is just a difference in the treatment relative to the control, and we're subtracting off this term here. We remember because we want to assuming that there's the same time trend in each time period, then we can control for this and we can subtract out any potential time effects here. Okay, so we covered this in um, the uh, second lecture and talked about it in the first as well. Okay, so you'd be expected to run through this. And again, the estimates just re replace the, the sample expectations with the population expectations, but that's the interpretation of all of the coefficients. And again, the solutions give you all the numbers so you can get all of these from the table um, at the end. Okay, so that was the key bit, was to link all this and to go through interpreting each of the ones and saying what they are and then we can get down to the key bit, which is what's his treatment effect, and you can just say intuitively what this is here and what it does. Okay, and the the, the data outputs the back. Well, to it's very simple to estimate these coefficients. You can just run OLS. So there's there's a table at the back which runs OLS, includes all of these variables, and the coefficients then just straight from the OLS table. Okay, so you can estimate that you can get the estimates from the table. So the key bit here was more the interpretation. It's relatively straightforward to get the numbers uh, from the table at. Um, the back. So finally then, now two parts more. So part C, so the researcher heard about a policy that was implemented in 2010 to increase employment rates by subsidising apprenticeships. The policy was implemented in Region A but not in B. Consider the following data for log employment for young people by region based on firm data. So again, you've just got the average earnings so that people in the age bracket in two different areas. So this is kind of, this is very related to the um, Card and Kruger fast food uh, data that we spoke about in lecture two, and ask you to compute a difference in difference between the two. Well, again, you've got four different. You've got the treatment and the control. So again, region A had the treatment and region B um, did not. So all you do here, well, you just work out the averages of e of all of all four of them in the for the treatment and the control before and after the. Um, the, the treatment happened. So remember, we, we, gave an, we gave an example of this in, I think it was in the second, um, let's put it onto the, so we've got the what's why, the, the treatment effect, remember, is just, in this particular case, is gonna be the change in the average for the treated minus the change in the average for the control. Okay, and again, we assume, so we can then, so the treatment, we want the average before, so the, the, the it happened in 2010, 
So we want the average before and the average after. So we can get the treatment, well, what's y1 bar t? What's the average here? Well, this is just going to be 1.345 plus 1.343, namely 2008 and 9, because before, before, uh, before the change occurred, divided by 2, and we've got after, we've got y bar 1 for the control, which is just, again, the average of the wages before the treatment occurred, which is 1.344. And then it's very simple for the next, because there's only one, there's only one time period after. So time period 2 after the potential treatment happened, well, this is just 1.35. What is it for region A and what is it for region B? So there's only one, there's only one observation here. So the average is very simple to compute. So that's it. So then the change in y bar t is y2 bar t. The difference between the, it's the change in the treatment outcome between the two periods. And what's the change for y bar control? Well, it's just the difference between, it's the average, it's the average for the control before and after. And again, remember we subtract this off because we want to see it, it, that one of the one of the problems is, is that there could be a change in the overall earnings of people throughout time. There could be a time trend. And remember, the key assumption is if the control group and the treatment group both have the same time trend, then when we subtract this out, we're subtracting off any potential time effect here. So we could, if there was no time trend, we could just look at what's the difference between the average earnings treated versus what's the average income for people after their policy and before. But if there was a time trend, we know that this would include not only the treatment effect, but also any changes that have happened because of a time effect. So if we assume that the control group, let's say the region is nearby, like in the uh, fast food data, if we can assume that the underlying, say, structural economy is similar, and if they both got the same time trend, if you subtract this off, well, this doesn't in, this doesn't include a treatment effect because of course they were just they were the control group and they didn't have the policy change. So that's the the intuition behind it, and we can show this is minus zero point one seven. So therefore, the difference in difference is zero point one seven six. Okay. In this example. So part D then relates. This is very similar. It's the same idea as the is the is same as the um, the Angrist and Card um, data in lecture two. So in the above, we didn't have individual level data. We only had the overall averages for the region. We didn't have it for individual people. So if individual people, you would run a regression where you include a Y. You'd have the person in region and T. You'd have a constant. You'd have a dummy for the area. You'd have a dummy for time, and you'd do a difference in different regression. This this is a dummy for the treatment, time, and the area therein plus E I R T. R is region, I is person, and T is time. So before we only had the region level, we didn't have the I level. Okay, so this would be the regression that you would run. Well, the problem is remember here. We need to have that there'd be random assignment into um, the, the policy. So the, I thought the question was a bit unclear because it's not actually said that the policy is optional or not. So, I mean, it, it, you can make a case either way as long as you make it very clear that you understand the assumption that is needed. We need in this regression that these there's no unobserved factors which are going to be correlated with someone's selection into the treatment. Okay, so if the policy was mandatory then it's likely that we can assume that the individual firms are not self-selecting namely that let's say it may be that say a um the, the the more successful firms are possibly more likely to want to adopt the the policy than ones that are not say in that case you would then have a classic endogeneity issue but if they were forced into it then they all had to do it then there's no selection bias there because then all firms have to do it okay so then there could, it, you could get to a deeper point where maybe the policy was implemented in that region because they was about to go into a recession or so on. So that could be another problem. But that would also be an issue for Part C as well. Namely, if the policy region A was selected 
because there was some change about to happen anyway, and they were trying to prevent that in a kind of in a counter in a to counter that, then you're gonna you're gonna have then a strong androgeneity problem. As all and as and again, so the solution C S A it's unlike it, the common trend assumption is met. Um, and it doesn't seem, if you look at the data above, it doesn't seem like they're possibly having the both have the same trend. But again, this would also be the case for part C. So we also need for part C, at the average level, we need to have that there's no, that the trend is the same for both. Namely, when we do this here, the whole point of doing this is assuming that this estimates the trend and it takes out the same trend here. So this would also be an issue for part C as well. So you can make a case, as long as you make clear that what the assumption is and you know intuitively why it is and then you make a case either way so it looks like possibly they had a different trend before and after but you can't really tell from you can't immediately tell from such a small amount um, of data okay so we'll leave it there for now I, I'm, I'm happy to do another session uh, if people want some more so if you see I can do another session do another couple of uh, quite I'll leave it there we've done quite a lot uh, there so hopefully the um, hopefully the it will save this time. And for the people that want feedback, sorry for the delay, I've said a lot. So I will get back to you for the people that have uh, emailed um, about that. Okay? So if you've got any questions, just let me know. And um, if you want me to cover any more questions, let me know. And I'll do another session uh, sometime uh, soon. Okay? So, bye.